through the private and public life of Princess Margaret. This program was first shown in January 1997. Your name's Chia. Princess Margaret has had a low royal profile for nearly 20 years. At 66, her life provides few headlines. But recently, she stepped back into the limelight with a stinging rebuke to the Duchess of York. In a letter, she told her, Not once have you hung your head in embarrassment. Clearly, you have never considered the damage you are causing us all. How dare you discredit us like this? But Margaret had herself already tarnished the royal image. When she returned from Moustique in 1976, she was in disgrace because she'd been exposed by the press with a lover 17 years her junior. It was she who was the first member of the House of Windsor to be divorced. She who was the first to be publicly criticized. Margaret has at times wanted to be the most royal of the royals, at others a rebel. Her life has been spent trying to resolve these contradictions. secretary hurried to Glam's castle in Scotland on urgent state business. It was his duty to attend any royal birth and the King Emperor George V was expecting his second grandchild. The first had been a girl, Elizabeth, but with no other royal babies on the horizon there were high hopes that this new baby might be a future king. announced from Glam's Castle that a daughter has been born to their Royal Highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of York, the Princess Margaret Rose. The new baby was only a girl. The Home Secretary took away with him the depressing news. There was still no new prince. With Princess Elizabeth, a toddler of four, Margaret was born into disappointment. The nation had prayed for a prince. Her sister became heiress presumptive and Princess Margaret next in succession. Just as the country was downcast by her birth, disappointment has been a theme of Margaret's life. Fifty years later, she herself appeared disappointed when she was interviewed on BBC Radio's Desert Island Discs. Roy Plumley invited her to talk about her talents but she seemed to prefer to dwell on her shortcomings. You have a gift for mimicry, you're a good musician, you love dancing. In other circumstances, do you think you would have been a performer? No, I don't think so. I wasn't any good at any of them. I mean, you're kind enough to say that I'm a good mimic, but I can't actually mimic people very well. There are other members of my family who are better at that. I'm not a very good musician. I can strum on the piano a little bit for other people to sing to. I think there are many things that Princess Margaret would have liked to have done in her life um, that she hasn't been able to do because of her position. And I think, without doubt, she has actually devoted her life um, 
to doing her, her duty in the way that she does for the Queen and for this country. At the age of 22, Margaret stood by while her sister was crowned and became the most prominent woman in the world. She has had to live her whole life in the shadow of the Queen. I guess I'll be second best to my grave, she once told a friend. She was more glamorous than the Queen. Uh, I think she was probably more intelligent than the Queen, certainly superficially. I mean, she was always, she was very amusing. She was talented, she played the piano beautifully, she sang. Um, she uh, was always a big success at any sort of social event. So I think she did find it, she found it difficult being number two. Um, I think it must be very difficult, um, being the only sister of the Queen. Um, I think it would have been easier for her if there had been other sisters, um, because just being the only one, it was really only playing second fiddle. There is one place where Margaret can throw off her second sister status, her own desert island, Mustique in the Caribbean. Here she can reign supreme. Rarely photographed, the island is renowned as the hideaway of the rich and famous, who take care to preserve their privacy. It was her sanctuary. It was her little haven. She liked to be amused. She liked to be busy. It was beaches. It was picnics, uh, luncheons, and then, of course, dinners. And our dinners would extend to little parties. We would try to organize some kind of music for her, which she liked. And she played the piano for us. She joined in, uh, trying to get a little action going. There's very little to do on Mustique except swim, and she would she would go swimming a couple of times a day, and people and and anybody with her on holiday had to swim with her like a flotilla following a whale, uh, the the sort of guide fish, and the the other pilot fish could swim behind and alongside, and conversations would ensue. She couldn't get any lobster. I looked at her drunk. And said, Never mind, ma'am. I'll get you some lobster and I'll send it up to you this afternoon. And I would. And it would always be received as a gift. Although I'd have been quite pleased if she paid for it. But even when surrounded by her court, Margaret is not fully at ease. She always smoked. She, she was a chain smoker from the moment I first met her. She always had a drink in her hand. She sipped it. She didn't guzzle. She didn't get drunk as such, but she was quite well oiled, shall we say. And I think she needed it to uh, she needed it. She was very quick-witted. She could defend herself, but she still had, in some mysterious way, I can't explain it, a lack of self-confidence. Early on in her life, it must have been clear to Margaret that she could never be her sister's equal. Do you remember the fun of walking along the curbs or low balustrades? Princess Elizabeth helps her small sister before running across to the other track. And at that she reaches the top first. A few years makes a lot of difference at that age. Margaret has always been one step behind her older sister. When their uncle abdicated in 1936, Elizabeth, overnight, became the heir apparent. While she was groomed to be queen, Margaret was encouraged to play the frivolous younger sister. Princess Elizabeth always uh, came across as uh, very steady, very stable, um, not terrifically curious about the world, um, very reliable. 
um, somebody who, in some in some way, ways was rather, rather, rather dull, even perhaps slightly priggish. Whereas um, Princess Margaret was much more sort of fay and um, imaginative and more mu musical, more artistic, um, uh, lived more in a kind of fantasy world. So the, the, there was that kind of difference of emphasis, which partly, of course, reflected what was expected of them. Uh, apart from doing good works and being a sort of shadow of, um, I don't know what aspirations they could possibly have had. I don't think it occurred to them in those days that I mean, if you were a member of the royal family, particularly if you were the sister of the Queen, um, you just were, you know, you just lived a nice life. The two princesses were isolated in Buckingham Palace. They didn't go to school, and other children rarely came to play. Margaret, four years younger, had only Elizabeth to compare herself with. Their governess gave them a rudimentary education, but Elizabeth was singled out for extra lessons in history. She was the one who had an important constitutional role to play. Then the king and his heir apparent take their place on the grass verge. An interesting picture this. Have you ever seen them alone together before? The queen and Princess Margaret look up. I think they were very proud of Elizabeth and very ambitious for her and longing for her to be a good heir to the throne. And so Margaret got rather overlooked. I think Margaret was left very much to, um, you know, muck out the stables, have a good time, play, um, you know, catch me as you can with the young officers, uh, sort of generally uh, rather enjoy herself. The king indulged Margaret. He knew she was often ignored and tried to make amends by spoiling her. Her governess noticed how Margaret learned to get attention. Margaret was always willful and headstrong, though Lilibet, with the rest of us, laughed at her antics, and indeed it was impossible not to. I think they often made her uneasy and filled her with foreboding. On more than one occasion, the official camera has caught her giving Margaret a nudge and a sisterly look that has said plainer than any words, Margaret, please behave. As Margaret grew up, her actions were to justify her sister's forebodings. Early in Elizabeth's reign, Margaret's behavior threatened to damage the monarchy when she fell in love with her father's equerry, a dashing war hero. Wartime fighter race, talented amateur jockey, a familiar figure of the continental turf. Group captain Peter Woolridge Townsend, CBO, DSO, DFC and Bar, mentioned in dispatches, former equerry to Her Majesty. But he is also the man the world has been talking about more and more over the past two years. Seldom Margaret's affair with Peter Townsend has become a legend. Townsend, a divorcee with two children, was judged unfit by the establishment to marry a princess. Margaret has been cast as the innocent victim of a tragic love. But there are those who doubt whether Margaret was ever truly in love. A teenager is often infatuated with an older man and think it's in love, but they are also very often under the impression that uh, love is not what it really is, and they're in love with love. He was being nice to her, naturally, because she was the king's daughter. He had been hoping that they could be very friendly without going too far. I managed to track down Townsend's cook, cleaner, cleaning lady, in the early 60s and spent a long time interviewing her and got a great deal of material. And of course, she witnessed many of these meetings when Margaret would come on horseback to the house and say to Townsend, you're coming out with me. I want to ride with you and you're coming out now. She was very arrogant, even at the age of 15 and 16. She knew what she wanted and no way was she not going to get it and she wanted Townsend. At first, her family turned a blind eye to Margaret's romance. But when she demanded to marry her hero, they had to take her seriously. Her choice of a divorced commoner wasn't welcomed by the Queen. 
Peter Townsend had this kind of mark of Cain on him, which was, albeit the innocent party, he had a previous marriage and he had children by that previous marriage. And of course it was only a few years since the searing trauma of the abdication crisis in 1936. That was in everybody's mind. Attitudes to divorce had not changed dramatically since that. Although Queen and Cabinet could not stop Margaret from marrying, they accused her of jeopardizing the good reputation of the monarchy. Her romantic dilemma was shared by the nation. Princess Margaret, third in line for the throne of Britain, now 25 and legally in control of her own destiny. Reporters and cameramen crowd round Group Captain Townsend's car as he drives away, but still he can say nothing. Outside Clarence House, where Princess Margaret and the Queen Mother are in residence, more cameras, more crowds. The popular press covered every new development, urging Margaret to stand her ground. As the weeks passed, the country waited to hear whether she would defy the establishment or whether she would bow to their demands. Her answer interrupted programs on the 31st of October, 1955. This is the BBC. The following personal message was issued from Clarence House by Princess Margaret about half an hour ago. I would like it to be known that I have decided not to marry Group Captain Peter Townsend. I have been aware that, subject to my renouncing my rights of succession, it might have been possible for me to contract a civil marriage. But, mindful of the Church's teaching that Christian marriage is indissoluble, and conscious of my duty to the Commonwealth, I have resolved to put these considerations... This famous announcement enshrined Margaret's image as the tragic princess, forced to sacrifice love for duty. But in reality, she'd been given a choice. Margaret could have married Townsend, but only if she'd given up her title of Royal Highness and the civil list income that went with it. The question remains whether she gave up her love for royal duty or for royal privilege. Although people have cast this couple as a Romeo and Juliet tragic romance, that's not true at all. There's no question that her love was strong enough a woman truly in love would have forsaken all that to be with the man she wanted to be with. Margaret couldn't walk away from that. She was far more in love with her lifestyle than she ever was with Peter Townsend. I, I noticed the other day, for instance, that in 1995, Princess Margaret was paid £219,000, which was reimbursed by the Queen to the Treasury. She lived and lived at Kensington Palace. Well, she has a flat with 21 rooms. She has seven servants. Peter couldn't afford one. The court turned its back on the loyal Aquarii. Immediately after the affair, Townsend was sent abroad, never to live in England again. Of course, if they had married, they were, there was a good chance it would have been a disaster because they were totally different in character. She was fun-loving, liked nightclubs, dancing, going on trips to the uh, West Indies. And Peter was more inclined to the quiet life. He, he was an extremely gentle, courteous man, and she, she was so imbued with herself. And I've sometimes wondered if she was in fact ever capable of real love. She's never done anything outrageous or vicious or anything. In fact, she's never done anything, really. I mean, if she'd stood up over, over Townsend, if she could have done, if she'd realised that she had a lot, lot of support, you know, I suppose it's too much to ask of anybody like that. Margaret had not been able to face life outside the royal fold. She had decided that being royal was safer than being in love.
Mitsubishi Galant displays some surprisingly human characteristics. Its passive rear wheel steering acts instinctively to keep a firm grip on the road, whilst its climate control system stabilizes the temperature to within a fraction of a degree. And the revolutionary automatic gearbox actually learns your individual driving style and adapts to the road conditions. The new Mitsubishi Galant, reinventing the wheel. Everybody likes Roseland, but just wait until you try it this way, with a sticky toffee coating that just concentrates the flavor. Mmm, it really gets the taste buds going. I'll show you how to make it in my new weekly guide to good cooking. In fact, I'll show you how to cook all the great classics and tell you how I give them all a lift to let their wonderful flavors come through. Mmm. Good Cooking with Gary Rhodes is on sale now, and this handy binder is free. You can now save £200 on your holiday at Thomas Cook. So don't just book it. Thomas Cook it. Ta-da! Oh, you look great! You nervous? Liar. Don't you worry, you'll be running that company before the week is out. Hey, you okay? Alan, well, you've got to speak to the builders. Because it's water-based, its unique color cream hydrates your hair. It's a gentle, permanent way to color. And your hair is silky and shiny. Clairol Hydrians. Incredible color that's incredibly gentle. Why does the UK's most popular breakdown service choose the UK's most popular mobile phone network? Simple. The AA demands a network that delivers the coverage they need. Vodafone meets that need, now and in the future. For a network you can rely on, the word is Vodafone. Each color has its own mood. Some intoxicate, others cool you down. Tonight, share Batak's passion for India. Princess Margaret comes to the mansion house for a welcome home reception after her Caribbean tour. Margaret had chosen the life of a royal, the familiar round of public duties, from opening hospital wards to deputising for the Queen on foreign trips. An example of how well travelled I am becoming is that when people now talk to me of Scarborough, my mind turns less naturally to the North Riding than to Tobago. <laughs> While she's relished the privileges of her life, she's been reluctant to accept its restrictions. Margaret has both clung to her position and wanted to escape royal conventions. I think she was very conscious of being a royal princess, which she was, and um, not an ordinary person, but wanted to have the excitement of ordinary life as well. So she wanted to have her cake and eat it, really. And most of the time in those early days, she did. Her social life during the 1950s was a catalogue of minor rebellions. Margaret was determined to flaunt convention. She lit up in public. Her long cigarette holder became her trademark. She stayed out late. She danced in jazz clubs. She had a set of people who had to be there. She would demand it and they were there, mainly men, mainly from the peerage. And she would keep them up until three and four in the morning. They couldn't leave until she decided she wanted to go. So these poor chaps, some of whom did actually do some work, even though they were peerage, had to stay on there with their eyes drooping until three or four in the morning. Margaret's rebellious behavior had strict limits. Her social circle was safely establishment. 
two future dukes, several earls, and various viscounts. There was constant speculation about which one she would marry, but they seemed not to want such a demanding royal spouse, and were quick to find other brides. At the age of 29, Margaret told friends she felt left on the shelf. Her chance for marriage and greater rebellion came when she met Tony Armstrong Jones. Tony was no aristocrat. He worked for a living as a society photographer. And Tony showed her another, another side of life. For example, he loved his passionate motorcyclist with all the leathers and the black gear. And Margaret loved to get on the back on the pillion. And there's an exhilarating experience for her to be whisked around the age of 29, unrecognized by anybody. By Margaret's standards, Tony's lifestyle was daring. His unconventional friends included models, actresses, and artists. He even had a bohemian hideaway in a rundown part of South London. I saw she'd never crossed the river before. That's a few, huge journey for her. Tony's studio proved the perfect place to indulge her fantasy of informal life. They had nicknames for each other. She called him Tone. He was allowed to call her Pet. They cooked simple meals together, spaghettis and things. And it was so different from a life in Clarence's house where she lived with her mother, uh, with footmen and servants around. There were no servants. Went to Rotherhide. And she adored it. In 1959, Margaret decided that she would marry Tony Armstrong Jones. Her family's reservations about his lifestyle and his social status only fueled her determination. Well, it wasn't what they'd expected, was it? It wasn't what anybody expected. She'd suddenly done something really daring and, 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 and different and, and, and just like she is. Oh, One-off department. Uh, I think they got on quite well. They sparred quite well together. And, and I think also that she was determined to, the willful nature in her a little bit, that after Townsend, she wasn't going to marry the sort of person that the establishment perhaps would have liked her to marry. And I think, in a way, it was a slight act of defiance. I mean, I don't suppose Tony Armstrong Jones was originally welcomed into the royal family at all. The honeymoon was a six-week cruise on the Royal Yacht Britannia, attended by a crew of over 250. The trip cost the taxpayer the equivalent of three quarters of a million pounds at current prices. The Royal Yacht. By young aristocrat Sarah Punsonby. Oh yes, my cousin Sarah Punsonby. Of course he did. Sarandle. I don't know what he did there, never went. Hippie heaven, wasn't it? Sarandle was a, I should imagine, a total hippie heaven. That was a real drop in and drop out, what it's called. Margaret was a frequent visitor to the commune but tried to keep her presence secret. When the news leaked out, local farmer John Rawlins was surprised to read in the press of her connection with his unconventional household. Having lived in the farm and uh, in such a lonely spot and being on your own and seeing a thing like that happen, it was a surprise, yes. It put the farm back on the map. Now you've got Surrender straight in front of you, a lovely barn, nice house. Um, I ain't been asked in before now, yes. I had cups of coffee. I, I, when I came in this yard once, I was the only one with clothes on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was the one that blushed. Roddy was quick to capitalize on his celebrity status. He used his royal connection to launch his singing career. But the more publicity he got, the more the Queen despaired. Margaret's behavior had provoked press and parliament into questioning the value of the monarchy itself. It's very, very clear that the palace held its hand up in horror at the whole thing. The Queen was having to go cap in hand to Parliament to ask for more money because inflation had so eroded the civil lists since the beginning of the reign. Uh, and this was happening just at the time of the 
um, the, the, the royal embarrassment over Roderick um, uh, Llewellyn, who was married very much younger than Princess Margaret. So you've got questions in the House about how many engagements she had, how many public engagements she had in relation to how much she was being paid. And that kind of fed into the, 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 the tabloid um, intrusion and, 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 and attack on her because of this relationship. And she, to some extent, I think, took a slightly defiant view of it all. Margaret's affair with Roddy dealt the final blow to her marriage. The House of Windsor had fought to maintain its image as the model family. There had never been a divorce in its ranks. But now the Queen had to give in. She allowed Margaret and Tony to separate. The unthinkable had happened. A royal marriage breakup. Well, I think that uh, Princess Margaret has been a PR disaster, uh, not just uh, for herself, uh, but uh, for the, the royal family. Uh, and I think that uh, probably in, in retrospect, the Queen herself would, would, have, would have to admit that. The debate which Margaret's behaviour provoked about the cost of the royal family has continued to this day. In 1993, the Queen finally bowed to public pressure and took Margaret and other second-rank royals off the civil list. Margaret still gets her allowance of £219,000 a year. The palace maintains that as she is now paid by the Queen, Margaret is no longer a cost to the taxpayer. But Margaret's money comes from an estate, the Duchy of Lancaster, whose ownership is disputed. Royalists generally like to put forward the idea that now the Queen is digging into her own pocket to pay for various relatives uh, who were seen as not really essential to the monarchy and all that kind of problem has been sorted out. Whereas really the Duchy of Lancaster belongs to the state. Historically it always was. And in the last century, uh, somehow or another by various secret deals, uh, the monarchy has managed to uh, get that money and put it in its private pocket. On top of her allowance, there are other perks which go with Margaret's royal position. Well, there are various items which are far less visible. Um, like the most important one is Kensington Palace, which is a very fine home in central London. And there's also the closet, clothing allowance for uh, foreign official visits. And even a home for her private secretary, uh, the 15th uh, Earl Napier, who also has uh, two other homes. She decided that it was too expensive for her to come out first class with all her entourage. So Colin was able to persuade her to come third class, or second class, what, uh, tourist, tourist class. And um, so of course she, then she booked, she would book tourist class. And of course Lord, whatever his name is, of, of BA, would say, we can't possibly. God's sake, move them up to first class. We'll have a riot on our hands. So always she paid third class and she flew first class. There are privileges to being a royal princess, but there are also responsibilities. Margaret is patron of various organizations, among them the Royal Ballet and the Girl Guides. Although the number of her engagements has been lower than others in her family, Margaret is preparing to take up duties dropped by the younger, disgraced princesses. I think she still works as many engagements as she's had for a long time. Um, and, uh, but she does find time to go on holidays, and in, in the summer she goes to, um, <clears throat> sometimes goes to Turkey and to Italy and then also up to Scotland. Um, and of course, in the sort of February months, I mean, she has a little spell in Mustique, uh, which I know she loves. Margaret still visits Mustique, but no longer with her boyfriend, Roddy Llewellyn. It was on the island she discovered the romance was at an end. He went all the way to Mustique before he told her, took her side while they were having dinner, and said, by the way, I'm getting married. And that was the first she knew about it. She didn't even know he was having a relationship with somebody else. And he came 
came out, of course, he'd been with another woman for nearly a year. Like Roddy Llewellyn, the other men in Margaret's life went on to find happiness elsewhere. Peter Townsend married a Belgian girl, Marie Luce Germain. Tony also remarried and started a second family. For male company, Margaret now has her walkers, a circle of single men she calls on when she needs to be escorted. I think she was probably impossible to live with. Uh, because maybe she couldn't let down that reserve even in an intimate situation. You might be sexually intimate with her, physically intimate with her, but somehow I believe that she was never being, uh, never able to relax and just become a woman. The princess now relies more and more on her family. Her children, Sarah and David, are both happily married, and Sarah has recently made Margaret a grandmother. As the princess withdraws into her own close circle, many of her old friendships are no more. I think she's lonely in her own house, but she's got a very wide family to connect with all the time, and apparently they do non-stop on the telephone, don't they, and a lot of them. Yaka, yaka, yaka. A lot of her old friends, she really hasn't, she doesn't see anymore for some reason. I mean, she's li like that. She does drop. If she makes up her mind she doesn't like you, there's no way you'll ever get back in. And that's sad in a way for her and, 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 and the friends she drops. The, the curious thing, you know, I shouldn't laugh about it, but I mean, it's that this happened with Margaret and all her fellows have then gone off and married people and had a lovely time and had children and so on and had very successful marriages and she's uh, well, sort of left on the, on the shelf. Thursday at 8.30, the troubled story of Grace Kelly, the screen goddess who became a princess.